Welcome uh, to our event today. I'm Bob Bernhardt. I'm the Vice President for Research at Notre Dame, and it's uh, my honor to, to host you, co-host you uh, this afternoon. Um, this event will be, I'm told, a interactive presentation. This is the way it was described. A uh, book signing and a reception. So I hope all of you will enjoy the afternoon. It'll be a varied uh, set of activities. Uh, your co-hosts today are the University of Notre Dame and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we're co-hosting this. At Notre Dame, uh, those co-hosts, uh, the people that have actually done uh, the effort to put this together, are two of our strategic centers. The Environmental Change Initiative, uh, which uh, leadership group includes uh, Jen Tank, Diogo Bolster, Alex Hardy, and Brett Peters, and our Center for Sustainable Energy, Leadership group includes Peter Burns, Ginger Sigmund, Barb Villarosa, and Shubhas Shindi. I would ask the, my colleagues who were involved in organizing this that are here today, if they'd please stand up so that people can see who they are in the, in the reception later on. So, Diogo. So on the behalf of Notre Dame, it's our sincere pleasure to welcome uh, all of you and Catherine Hayhoe, our speaker today. The Notre Dame has been a, a partner with the, the Nature Conservancy for quite a few years. Uh, I've been chatting with some of the TNC people as we uh, prepared for this, and it goes back to our early days of right after I got here in 2007 when we started to develop the uh, initiatives that I talked about earlier. TNC has been a great partner. Uh, it gives us one of our best mechanisms for translating our research programs out into practice. And they have some people co-located with us here, and we're very happy uh, and find this uh, relationship to be very productive. So we're very, very pleased to have them as a partner and have them as a co-host for today's event. So I'm going to turn over the podium here to Larry Kremers, the TNC Indiana director, to say a few words of welcome as well. Thank you, Bob, and yes, welcome, and, and thanks for taking a beautiful day today and coming indoors for this event. I know that might be hard to do, but uh, I think you'll find it uh, a very enjoyable time here today. I, uh, as Bob said, I'm Larry Clemens. I'm the state director for the Nature Conservancy here in Indiana. I've worked with the organization for 30 years now um, in a variety of roles. One of the roles was beginning to form this partnership with Notre Dame and the Environmental Change Initiative and working with David Lodge and some of the original people that helped start that, even Peter Annan. Some of you might remember that name uh, that was here with the, the Change Initiative. Um, I really appreciate that partnership that we've always had and would love to see our relationships continue to grow, whether it's around energy or some of our work with uh, agriculture and certainly around climate here. The Nature Conservancy in Indiana has four priorities right now that we work on. Uh, one of them is protecting land. That's what probably most of you know us about in Indiana. We've protected over 100,000 acres and we have a goal to protect another 40,000 acres in the next five years. So a very aggressive goal, but we do think this decade is a really critical decade for protecting land, especially here in Indiana. We also do a lot of work with sustainable agriculture. So we do uh, work with farmers, farm groups, to try to improve the sustainability of agriculture. And of course, most of us know the important role agriculture can play in addressing climate change. Um, those agricultural landowners and even forest landowners are the people that we need to make decisions to put carbon back into the earth. They're the ones that can make that decision on their own, so they're critical to work with. And the third area that we're focused on is inspiring people for nature in Indiana. We know that our Hoosiers and our fellow Hoosiers have to start valuing nature even more so in the coming decades. Lastly, we do work on climate change, and it's uh, an initiative that we've started in the last couple of years. Uh, we did a study a couple years ago, and we, two studies in fact, where we find that Hoosiers, uh, by a significant majority, relate our human actions to changing climate. 
which was significant for Indiana compared to perhaps 10 years ago. And they're also willing to start taking actions to address climate change in our state, which again, very important finding right now in that people are willing to look at policies. They're willing to pay more for certain things to start putting carbon back into the earth and eliminating or lessening the amount of carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere. Our farmers are already leading the way in the country. Our farmers are adopting practices like cover crops that are very good for carbon and putting carbon back in the earth. We lead the country in Indiana. No other state has a higher percentage of cover crop acres than us. We're also working at the policy level with our states or our, our uh, congressional leaders. Senator Braun is a, is a key leader there, as is Todd Young, and introducing legislation at the federal level. So we're working very closely there. And then we're having industries across Indiana that are stepping up, like NYSource, who's pledged to reduce their emissions to zero in how they produce energy, energy for us. So they're converting coal-fired to solar and wind-generated wind uh, electricity. And even in our own operations, we operate six offices in Indiana across the state, and we're evaluating solar at all of our offices right now, and I expect in the next few years we'll start to convert much of our uh, electrical needs to uh, solar and uh, converting our vehicles and things like that. We've made a goal of by 2030 to, to have our emissions from our business operations as the Nature Conservancy in Indiana at zero. So we're, we're on an aggressive path there and looking forward to that. And I think that's a, a good way to sort of hand this back to you, Bob, to do the introduction and, and get right into this great topic and great speaker we have with us. Thank you very much, Larry. It is my honor and privilege to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is an accomplished climate scientist whose research focuses on assessing and effectively communicating the regional to local scale impact of climate change on human systems and natural environment. In addition to her role as the chief scientist of Nature Conservatory, which is a relatively recent appointment, she is the Paul Whitfield Horn Distinguished Professor and Political Science Endowed Chair in Public Policy and Public Law in the Department of Political Science at Texas Tech University. To date, Catherine's scholarly work has uh, resulted in more than 125 peer-reviewed publications. But she has more than the sum of her uh, peer-reviewed publications. She's contributed to both national and global climate policy, including uh, a lead author role in several U.S. national climate assessments. These find the findings of these studies have been presented before Congress, uh, highlighted in briefings to state and federal agencies, and used as input for future planning by communities, states, and regions. Catherine is also the host of the PBS digital series, Global Weirding. Catherine has been honored as a remarkable science communicator, receiving several awards, including the National Center for Science Education's Friend of the Planet Award, the American Geophysical Union's Climate Communications Prize, and the Sierra Club's Distinguished Service Award. It's not hard to understand why she's included on lists of most influential people in the world. In a role as chief scientist, Catherine is now responsible for the Nature Conservancy's wider portfolio of global climate adaptation and advocacy work. Please welcome Catherine Hayhole. Thank you so much for that introduction. Isn't it great to be together? It feels like it's been a really long time. So some of you know, and some of you may not know, that I used to live here. So campus is very familiar, and I swear that I have been at a seminar in this room before. <laughs> so I want to start off by just asking you to join me. This is an interactive discussion, and you're going to use this to ask me questions at the end. But I want to invite you to go ahead and join me on pollev.com slash Catherine. You have to spell it with two A's. Otherwise, you're going to end up in the wrong spot. So on your phone or your computer, whatever device you have, I haven't tested it out yet on Apple Watch, so I can't guarantee that, but everything else, 
P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash Catherine. If it asks your name, you can just push skip. No need to enter your name. And when you get in there, I want you to tell me in one word, and this is going to be difficult, just one word, your favorite thing about Notre Dame. Now, I realize not everybody here is a Fighting Irish fan. That's clear. But what is your favorite thing about Notre Dame? It could be the beautiful campus. Let me get rid of this. There we go. Here we go. Oh, optimism. I like that. The lakes. Yes. I was, you know what? I was thinking about the lakes too. <laughs> the culture, partnerships. Oh, the grotto. Yep. That's very unique. It's mission. It's optimism. It's tradition. It's collegiality. That's a good one, especially with so many faculty in the room. Excellent. It's resources and it's trees. Yes. Nice. I think any university should be proud. Oh, research. I like that that one's coming out. Any university should be proud to have th people say these things about it. And if you want a copy of this afterwards, we can get you one, of the <laughs> one Bob. All right. So now you know how this works. And I'm going to ask you another question now, and then another as we go along. And then at the end, you get to ask me questions using the same tool. But now I'm going to ask you a question that is even more serious. And it is this. Again, it, give me one word. And if you have to use more than one word, put a dot or a dash in between it. When, when, I, when you say climate change, or when I say climate change, what do you feel? Give me a word for the emotion that you feel. When you hear somebody say climate change, you see a news report about climate change, you hear that there's a new scientific report out about climate change, how do you feel? You are not alone. In fact, I probably could have come up with the top 10 of these words without even asking you. Because this is how everyone feels today. We feel worried, concerned, sad, doomed, anxious, overwhelmed, exhausted, depressed, daunted, dejected. This is how we feel. And you know what? We have every reason to feel this way. Why? Because we are conducting a truly unprecedented experiment with the only home that we have. As far back as we go in the history of this planet, we have never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly. It is truly an unprecedented experiment. And what is it doing to us? It's not about saving the planet. This piece of rock will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. It's about us and almost every other living thing on this planet. That is what is at risk. And the biggest way that we're seeing it impact us is not through global warming, the slow, inevitable upwards creep of global average temperature, but rather it's through something I call global weirding, which is the fact that wherever we live, we have a pair of weather dice, so to speak, natural weather dice. And we naturally roll a double six, a heat wave, a storm, a flood, a blizzard, a drought, all the time. When we look at a map of the United States, and I live in Texas now, that's that dark red one there, but you know, Indiana is a fairly, fairly dark pink. We see that we have many, many extreme events. This is the total number of events that have occurred since 1980. But what's happening as the world warms decade by decade is we see that Climate change is sneaking in, so to speak, if we could personify it, sneaking in and taking one of the numbers on our dice and replacing it with a six, taking another number and replacing it with a six, taking another number and replacing it with a seven. And so all of a sudden we think, how could this be? We just had three 500-year flood events in three years. We just had a heat wave that was more massive and more extensive and more extreme than we've ever seen. How could that happen? The answer is climate change is loading the weather dice against us. We see this trend at the scale of the entire United States. From year to year, the number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters goes up and down. That's weather, right? But decade by decade, it's ticking up. Why? For three reasons. What's reason number one? More people, more valuable infrastructure. That alone is causing this to increase. What's reason number two? Vulnerability. The American Society for Civil Engineers gives our infrastructure a failing grade. Our storm sewer system, our water system, our bridges and roads and dams. 
The only thing that got a B, I think, was our rail, and that's something we don't often think about. We see the same trend in the Great Lakes. This is for the whole Great Lakes region. Now I see that my Mac is warning me I have a low battery and I forgot to plug in. So if you don't mind just reaching in that, my bag right there and passing me my white power cord. <laughs> this podium comes equipped with a million really excellent cords, but no power cord. Thank you. That's it. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. It's so funny, you know, you get used to doing things on Zoom and you forget about things like plugging in the computer, right? Yes. It used to be second nature to always plug in the computer. Just a second here. There we go. So when we see average temperature increasing, and this is the average temperature increase over the Great Lakes region, you can see again from year to year it goes up and down, but decade after decade it ticks up. And when we see that our heavy rainfall is increasing because warmer air holds more water vapor. So when a storm comes along today, there's more water vapor up there for the storm to sweep up and dump on us than there was 50 or 100 years ago. Why do we care about these trends? We care about them because they're affecting us. We see that we're going to see a significant increase in heat danger days. And I apologize, this is for Indianapolis, but you get the picture. A lot of you live in Indianapolis. In the 2000s, three days of, with a heat index. So what's the heat index? It's the heat plus humidity, right? It makes it feel like 105. Three days, and they felt bad. By the 2030s, which is next decade, we're already in 2022. By the next decade, 25 of those crazy days. We also see that what it's going to feel like is essentially migrating south. And I thought this was really interesting because Climate Central has this great tool where you can enter where you live, South Bend, Indiana, and they, it says, what will your summers feel like by the end of the century? And guess where South Bend went to? where I went to from South Bend. So people sometimes ask me, why did you move to Texas? And I say, I'm just previewing global warming. As it gets worse and worse, I'll just move all the way back up again. <laughs> but that's a pretty significant difference, because I can tell you, the way our homes are built here are radically different than the way our homes are built in Texas. Mosquitoes are a big deal here. I won't ask who had to spray their bushes, but it's a significant issue. Well, guess what? It's not your imagination. The mosquito season has already grown. It's already 20 days, almost 20 days longer than it used to be. And then there's the heavy rainfall that causes floods. We lived in a historic home on West Colfax, and we were warned that there was this valve in the basement. And there was a hole in the bottom, and you had to like lift this metal lid off, and there was this big wheel that you had to turn whenever it rained. And if you didn't turn it, we were warned, you would have the storm sewer backing up into your basement. So wherever we were, we could be at a movie. I remember being at a movie, and you'd be always listening for rain. And if it was raining, we would drop everything, and we would bolt home, even if it was in the middle of a movie, and we would run down the basement, and we would shut that valve. So we did that for two years, and then we went back to Canada for the summer. I'm from Canada myself. And one of my husband's graduate students from Notre Dame was babysitting our house, or house sitting. We warned him about it, but you know, when you're not the house owner, you don't necessarily think about it quite as carefully. And he didn't get home until there was four feet of standing water in the basement. <laughs> Thank goodness for Allstate. This is something that we're already vulnerable here to, we're already exposed to here, but climate change is taking an existing threat and making it worse. And if you notice the date on these headlines, the date 2019, 2021, 2022. We care about these changes because they are affecting our water and we can't live without it. They're affecting our food and we can't live without that. They affect our health. And obviously, we can't live without that. And they are affecting every aspect of our infrastructure, which was built for a planet that does no longer exist. The current conditions that we are living through have never been experienced in the history of human civilization on this planet, and that's why it matters. We are not prepared for what is coming. And you know, it's even affecting present day events. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its Working Group 2 report last Monday. 
This report focuses on what is happening in the places where we live and how we have to prepare. And if we don't reduce our emissions, we will not be able to adapt. As the scientists were meeting the Sunday night before the report was released to approve the final, final report, one Ukrainian climate scientist who had logged into the Zoom meeting as missiles and bombs were going off around her apartment said this. She said, human-induced climate change and the war on Ukraine have the same roots, our dependence on fossil fuels. We will not surrender in Ukraine, and we hope that the world will not surrender in building a climate-resilient future. We care about climate change because it affects every aspect of our lives here on this planet. Our water, our food, our safety, our security, our economy, our health. Climate change is not its own separate issue or its own separate bucket. The reason we care about climate change is because it affects our infrastructure that we take for granted until it doesn't work. It affects our economy already today. It affects our energy use and supply, our water availability and quality, our natural resources, our health, our food, our biodiversity that we're trying to protect. It affects political conflict, resource scarcity, and most of all, it is a justice and inequity issue because those who have contributed least to the problem are the ones who are bearing the brunt of the impacts, whether it is the low-income countries whose 3.5 billion poorest people have contributed to 7% of carbon emissions, or whether it's in big cities right here like Chicago where low-income neighborhoods are disproportionately impacted by air pollution from fossil fuels, by extreme heat during heat waves, by flooding during heavy precipitation events, and more. So what does this mean? It means something very revolutionary. It means that to convince people to care about climate change, we don't have to make them care for the same reason I do. You might care for two or three of these reasons, but somebody else could care for a different reason, and that's totally OK, right? We don't have to convince everyone to care for the same reason we do. As humans, we often try to do that, though, because we think our reasons are so self-evident. Everyone should obviously care for the same reasons we do. But if they don't, that's OK. And that means we don't have to recruit people to our group. We can let them be in their group and show them how they're already the perfect person to care. And perhaps most importantly, and these were the most difficult chapters to write in my book, but I thought the most important ones on guilt and shame. We don't have to try to manipulate people or coerce them into acting as if they don't have any reason to other than how others see them. We can show people that who they already are is already the perfect person to care. If they live in Indiana, if they are a farmer, if they are a small business owner, if they own a home in South Bend, if they care about nature and biodiversity and conservation, if they're a veteran or they care about national security, if they're a human being living on planet Earth, they're already the perfect person to care. So what I often do, and I encourage people to do this in my book, is I take an inventory of who am I, and then how can I connect with other people over something we share. So walk with me through this as I share it with you. So first of all, obviously, I live in Texas. So I can connect with people over the fact that I live in Texas, and you live in Indiana. I'm Canadian, so I often connect with fellow Canadians over what's happening in Canada. I'm a mother, so I joined a group called, and in fact, I helped found a group called Science Moms. That's mothers who are scientists who care about climate change. And yes, we let dads join too, and grandparents, and aunts and uncles. I love skiing, and I have talked to people about how I'm worried about what's happening to our snowpack and the communities who depend on it for their economic revenue. I grew up being fortunate enough to be able to run through the woods every day of my life, every summer of my life. And I love nature. And so I love talking to people about the benefits of nature and being outside in nature and about biodiversity and conservation and being able to protect the places that we love. And I'm a Christian. And so I connect with people over a shared faith, a perspective that we have responsibility to care for every living thing on this planet. That's right from the book of Genesis. And we are called to care for those less fortunate than us. So those are the things that I've connected with people over. And 
I'm really convinced that just about anybody, whoever they are, they already have every reason they need to care about climate change. We just have to help them see what that is. So I'm going to ask you now. Don't worry, I gave you like five or six things. I'm just going to ask you for one. Go back to polyv.com. And I want you to give me a word. And if it's more than one word, like put a dot or a dash in between. Who are you? I care about climate change because I am a what? What makes you the perfect person to care about climate change? And I don't want to see the same answers here. I want to see different answers here. Because we're all different people. All right. I love this. So we've got uh, different roles that we play in our family. We've got grandfather, parent, mom, dad. But we've got botanist, artist, physician, student, oh, watershed ecologist, yep, skier, gardener. We've got people who are young. We've got people who are old. We've got people who spend time in nature. We've got people who spend time indoors. We've got different expressions of, of faith. We've got, oh, I love that. I care because I'm a neighbor. Yes, love your neighbor as yourself. You're being a good neighbor. Every single one of us has every reason we need to care, and so does everybody else. So you don't have to make someone a teacher, if you are a teacher, to make them care about climate change. You don't have to make someone a skier, if you're a skier, to help them care about climate change. You don't have to convince somebody to be a gardener, although, honestly, I think you should. <laughs> but you don't have to to make them care about climate change. You see that? It is simple, but it is revolutionary. So whoever we already are is already the perfect person to care. And if somebody doesn't realize it, what's our job? Our job is to help them figure out who do you love? What do you love? Where do you love? Connect the dots to how climate change affects them and show them how climate action benefits them. Isn't that a bit different than trying to convince somebody to care for the same reason you do? So, I get asked two questions wherever I go, <laughs> and these are the two questions. First question, how do I talk about this? How do I talk about it? Often climate changes and we get worried. Like I said, 70% of us are worried, right? And everybody in this room, I mean, I saw all those words you put on, we're worried, so what do we do? We look around and we say, nobody else is as worried as we are, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna load up on all the scary facts that I can find, and believe me, there are a lot of truthful, scary facts out there. Just take the latest IPCC report, the latest doorstop of doom, as I call it. You've got enough scary facts there to send anybody into a depression. So we load up on all the scary facts that we can find, and we share that with people to say, hey, you gotta wake up. But here's the thing. Our human brains are programmed to respond to fear in one of two ways. If we know what we do, what to do, we will do it as fast as we can. But if we don't know what to do, we'll turn off. So what happens is people end up rejecting it even more, and inaction results. One of the most interesting books I've read was by a neuroscientist. It was called The Influential Mind by Tally Sherratt. And she says, and she's not talking about climate change, but she is talking about climate change, right? Fear and anxiety will cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. And so climate just changes more. And so that's why there's so many people today who actually fall into the category of doomerism. Because they've tried this cycle so many times, it just didn't work. And they figure, what, you know, if this didn't work, what is? The most of us are already worried about climate change. 70% of everyone in the United States, 83% of mothers, 86% of young people are already worried. But fully half of us feel hopeless and don't know where to start. You know how many of us are activated? 8%. This is the biggest problem we have. It's not between the people who do or, do or don't agree it's real. I know their voices are loud. The biggest problem we have is the gap between everybody who's worried and those who know what to do. What's holding us back? It is not lack of access to data on Arctic sea ice, Greenland glaciers, or polar bear populations. That's not what's holding us back. What's holding us back is we don't understand why it matters to us here and now, and we don't know what we can do to fix it. That's what's holding us back. And we see this in the actual data. 
we humans are really good at psychological distance. We are really good at pushing risks away into t far into time. Oh, that's the future, not now. It's over there, not here. It's, it's important to those people, but not me. We do this as a defense mechanism when we don't know what to do. Because we can't maintain all that anxiety without being able to respond to it. And when you look at the Yale program on climate communications, amazing maps, where you can zoom in by county and by congressional district, they just came out with a brand new set of maps a couple of weeks ago. We see that across the whole US, most people, and you can see I put my pinpoint there on St. Joseph County, most people agree, sure, global warming is real. OK, those are the facts. Yes, global warming will harm plants and animals. Where's the psychological distance there? Non-human species distant in terms of relevance, right? Yes, it will harm future generations, people in the future, but not now. Oh, we're getting a little bit lighter, but still, yes, it will harm people who live over there, not here. So we're all on board with it being real, plants and animals, future generations, people in developing countries. And then they ask this question, do you think it will affect you? What happened? The map completely flipped. You know, you've got the California wildfires, you've got the western drought and uh, decreasing snowpack and water situations. You've got Alaska where the permafrost is thawing under people's feet. But I mean, even on Alaska, it's not dark red. If the permafrost thawing under your feet is not enough to turn it dark red, what is? <laughs> What we have to do is we have to show how it is here, it is now, it is concrete, and it is relevant. That's what we have to do. What else do we have to do? We have to talk about what we can do to fix it, too. Because if you tell people there's a problem, but you don't tell them what to do about it, what else can we do except sort of metaphorically go back to bed and pull the covers up over our head? You just can't deal with that type of anxiety on a long-term basis. People are willing to act if they feel like what they do is going to make a difference. And the fancy social science word for that is efficacy. If we feel like we can make a difference, we'll do it. But today, all around the world, we, all of us, have a crippling lack of efficacy. We are convinced that with almost 8 billion people on the planet, nothing we do will make a difference. And so, we do nothing. But we see, right now today in the Ukraine, that yes, individual actions do make a difference. And people standing together do make a difference. And it is exactly the same with climate change, as that scientist said. So how do we tackle this? What do we do about the psychological distance? How do we create a sense of efficacy in people? By doing something so simple that you might be incredulous that that's what I'm going to say. But it is something that we're not doing. And what is that? Well, Remember, I left you with this map here. Do you think it's going to affect you personally? This is not the darkest blue map. There's one that's darker blue. Do you ever talk about it? Do you ever talk about it? And here's the connection. If you don't talk about it, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you know what you can do about it? Talking is not sufficient. Obviously, just talking, talking, talking isn't going to fix it. But talking is the first necessary step. How do you do anything without communication? So what do we need to talk about? I, a climate scientist, who studies all of these things I mentioned, global average temperature, ocean heat content in exajoules, shrinking Arctic sea ice, tropospheric trends. I, a scientist, am going to tell you, you know what? That is not what you need to talk about. We need to talk about why it matters, that connects to our heart, and what we can do about it, that connects to our hands. And you know who the best person to have that conversation is? It's not me. Scientists are number two. It's you. People we know. So how do we talk about how climate change is affecting us? I was in Iowa virtually a few months ago, and somebody asked a good question. They said, how do you talk about polar bears where I live? I said, you don't. If you're in Iowa or Texas, you talk about farming. And if you're in Indiana, you do too. 
If you're out west, you talk about wildfires. If you're in Vancouver or across the Midwest or out in the Northeast, you talk about flooding. If you're in a big city like Chicago or Houston or LA, you talk about air pollution and our health. If you're in Notre Dame, you talk about Laudato Si. We talk about whatever people already care about. I bet you've never seen a picture of a polar bear and the Pope before. <laughs> and they're both white. <laughs> we have every reason we need to care. And as a Catholic institution, this comes straight from the Pope. The global warming caused by the enormous consumption of some of the wealthiest nations on the planet has repercussions in the poorest places on the planet. Talk about how climate change affects us and then talk about what we can do to fix it. What can we do to fix it? We know what we can do to fix it. We have to stop putting so much carbon into the atmosphere. We have to start taking more carbon out of the atmosphere because carbon in our grasslands, our wetlands, and our soil, and our trees is an amazing, wonderful thing. And we have to build resilience to the impacts we can no longer avoid. What do these solutions look like? These solutions, like efficiency, through efficiency alone, we could cut US carbon emissions in half and save a ton of money. Solar energy is now the cheapest form of electricity we have ever had in the history of the human race in many parts of the United States and around the world in low-income countries as well. But also, these solutions save money. They create jobs, and they give us cleaner air. Did you know that 10 million people every year die prematurely from air pollution from burning fossil fuels? That's double the number of COVID every single year. So there's win-win-wins, oh, and they stop the carbon from going into the atmosphere. Then there's solutions that take carbon out of the atmosphere. Regenerative agriculture, preservation, conservation, planting trees, protecting wetlands, building wetlands. Oh, and they enrich our soils, they protect our ecosystems, they filter our nutrients and our fertilizers, and they take up carbon. Building resilience. They enable us to restore traditional grasslands and prairies, forests and ecosystems. And then there's the resilient solutions. What do they do? What if you green an urban neighborhood, a low-income urban neighborhood in Chicago that was historically redlined, racist lending and insurance practices that led to many of these neighborhoods being much hotter than the wealthier neighborhoods in the same city? I was working with the city of Chicago over 10 years ago on their climate action plan. And we had the Department of Emergency Response in the room. And at first, you could tell they were thinking, why are we here? We have better things to be doing. But when I said that we could generate projections of days per year over 95 or 98 or 100, they said, well, could you generate days per year over 92? And I said, well, yeah, of course. I said, why? They said, because we staff by the thermometer. In South Chicago, when it hits a certain point on the mercury, we know that there is going to be heat stress, there are going to be emergency medical calls, there are going to be um, even, you know, our tempers flare when it gets hotter too. So what if we green low-income neighborhoods to provide a shade canopy that cools those neighborhoods down during a heat wave? Well, as those trees grow, they also provide flood protection because it's permeable surfaces. They also filter and clean up our air. They improve our mental health as well as our physical health. Oh, and they take up carbon too. This is what real solutions look like. And I was talking to a colleague from Oxfam, an international charity that works uh, a lot with women and children in low-income countries, but she lived in Chicago. I told her about this, and she said, we can do this in Chicago? I said, yes. She's like, well, maybe I should take my family, and we should find a group who's doing it, and we should help do that on our Saturdays. And then what could she do? She could talk about it. So I asked Larry, I said, what, Larry, what's your favorite solution here in Indiana? What are you most excited about? And he said, Everything we're doing with farmers, that is what I am most excited about. And there's so much going on. So I just wanted to share some good news with you that you might not know about clean energy and farming in Indiana. In this report, Indiana's Climate and Energy Future, the Nature Conservancy put out, and you can find online, it turns out that renewable energy benefits for landowners who host the land that you put wind or solar on they could be getting between 23 to $50 million in Indiana alone by 2035. Tax revenues, 50 to 110 million in local tax revenues in rural counties. 
One out of every five people in this state live within 10 miles of a coal plant, which is a huge source of air pollution. Closing those down would provide health benefits to 127,000 of our most at-risk residents. What happens if we put a price on carbon? Farmers could take in almost $400 million in carbon credits if we had a price on carbon. Insurance payments could be lowered by 311 to 357 million, and farmers could save almost a billion dollars annually from nutrient uh, loss through natural climate solutions. I mean, the more you learn about these, and the more you tell other people about them, people feel like, wow, we can do that here. We can do that now. There's win, 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 wins, and oh, and it helps with climate change too. We often picture climate action like a giant boulder sitting at the bottom of an impossibly steep cliff with only a few hands on it, and it's not budging an inch. That boulder, when we start to look around at everything that's happening in Indiana, in the Midwest, in the Great Lakes region, in the United States, and around the world, where 90% of new energy installed around the world last year was clean energy, we realize that giant boulder is already at the top of the hill. It is already rolling down the hill. It already has, and I couldn't find a royalty-free picture with a million hands on it, but I'm looking for one. So if you find one, send it to me. It already has a million hands on that boulder. And if you add yours, and if you use your voice to encourage others to add theirs, it will go faster. So climate changes, and we get worried. Here's where you break the cycle. Instead of loading up on scary facts, what do you load up on? Why it matters here and now in ways that are relevant to our lives. My basement, my field, my home, my city, my preserve, and positive solutions. What happens? People feel empowered and action results. And that's the way our brain is wired. To go back to the neuroscience, the human brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not avoiding harm. So if we reframe our message, and again, I promise you she's not talking about climate change, but she is talking about climate change. If you reframe your message so the information you provide induces hope, not dread, that is how we move people. But that brings me to the second most common question I get, and don't worry, the answer to this one is quite short. Oh, before I go there, I'm sorry, what gives us hope? Who should I be talking to? Often, we focus on the person who brings it up all the time like a sore tooth. We focus on the dismissive person that we know who might be a family member, a neighbor, a colleague, a, you know, college roommate. We think this is the person that we need to convince. But you know what? As loud as they are, they're only 8%. Who do we need to convince to act? People who are already alarmed or concerned or even cautious, but they don't know what to do. The biggest gap is not between those who say climate change is or isn't real. The bigger gap is between those who say it's real, but they don't understand how it matters to them. And the even bigger gap is between those who say it's real and who are activated. So where do we spend our time most effectively? Not the orange arrow, although I certainly have conversations there. And if we begin with something we have in common, we can find common ground. But what do we do about it? That is our biggest challenge. And that's where our conversations come in. People often say to me, well, everybody around me thinks the same thing, so why talk about it? I say, well, first of all, if you never talk about it, how do you know? And second of all, unless you are miraculously surrounded by 8% of people, your talking will help people understand why it matters and what we can do to fix it. George Marshall wrote a great book called Don't Even Think About It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change. And I was just speaking to him recently because we were working together on the climate action website for the Don't Look Up movie with Netflix. It's a great website. If you, look, if you could go count us in, Don't Look Up, fantastic website on climate action and what individuals can do. And guess what the first thing you can do on that website is? Talk about it. Guess what the second thing is? Join a group and talk about it together. <laughs> and then talk with your money, talk at work, talk to your politicians. <laughs> Engaging is how we do it. And why is that important? George says, talk is the fertile field on which cultural change begins. In its absence, it's impossible for a group of people to solve a problem. Again, it's not sufficient, but it's essential. 
conversations underpin all of our action. How we invest our money, what party we vote for, what energy source we use at home or at work or at school, I would add. How did everything start with a conversation? The goal, and this is really important, the goal of the conversation is not to tell people about climate change. The goal is to expand the number of people in the conversation. That's a different perspective. So that's why when I did my TED Talk, I did a TED Talk on the most important thing you can do is talk about it. And five months after I did my TED Talk, I was giving a talk um, at the London School of Economics on one of the bundled trips like this one where I do every possible event as I can in one place. Um, I was at Ann Arbor yesterday, going on to Chicago tomorrow, University of Illinois after that. Five months after my TED Talk, I was giving a talk, and at the end, I saw this man waiting for me. And he said, I've been working for climate action in my town where I lived, which is in the outskirts of London, for years, and nothing was happening. And then I saw your TED Talk, so I decided to talk about it. And I collected all the names of people who've had conversations since we watched your TED Talk. Do you want to see the list? I said, sure. He reached in his bag, and he pulled out this list, and I expected 70 or 80 people. 10,000 people in his town, about the same size as South Bend, Mishawaka. And he said, as a result, the city council just voted to declare a climate emergency. A year on, they had put up a 20 million pound uh, bond to do climate adaptation and resilience because one man started to have conversations. So start with something you have in common, connect the dots to how climate change matters, and always, always, always talk about how we can work, whoops, how we can work together to fix it. The second question I get all the time is, what gives you hope? And when we talk about hope, we have to be clear that hope begins by saying it's bad. It's going to get worse. Success is not inevitable. But there is a possibility of a better future. And here is the pathway to get there. Where do we find hope? We find it in action. Greta is somebody who should know, right? She began to act because she was overcome with anxiety over climate change. And she says, the one thing we need more than hope is action, because once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So to conclude, this is an essay I wrote after the last IPCC report came out in August. I wrote this essay on how do, how do we respond to the latest doorstop of doom. And this is how I ended. I said, when we look at how change in our modern industrialized society has occurred, it never occurred because the King of England just woke up one day and said, we really need to end slavery. It didn't end because the President of the United States was having dinner and turned to his wife one night and said, we really need to give women the vote, don't we? The National Party of South Africa didn't just opt to end apartheid. No, this change began when ordinary people of no particular power or wealth or fame decided the world could and should be different. We know a few of these names today, but they were not famous, influential people before. We know their names because of what they did. They shared and supported and fought for their visions of a better world. They were simply people who had the courage of their convictions, who did what? Who used their voices to advocate for the societal changes we need. We, we are the people who have changed the world before, and we are the people who can change it again. So at this point, the only question I have is, what are we waiting for? Last question for you, and then you get to ask me questions. Pick up your phone again, your tablet, your computer, and I want a word for you. When I think about climate change now, I feel what? How are you going to feel when someone says climate change now? What are you going to do? I'm sorry for that, and I totally understand. But if you feel numb, look at the solutions. Go read the Nature Conservancy's Clean Energy Report for Indiana. Go read the city of Chicago's Climate Action Plan. Go to Notre Dame and read, read their sustainability plan for this university. If you still feel paralyzed and despairing, I understand why. But take action, because you know what? Hope is really not a feeling. Hope is an action. You go out and you practice active hope and you look for things that help you see that, yes, there is action that is happening. Yes, I can be empowered. Yes, I can be encouraged. I can take action. Oh, I like talkative. <laughs> That's a great one. I can be talkative. I can be determined. I can be inspired. I can be motivated. 
This is not easy. This is not just you know, closing your eyes and saying, if I wish hard enough, it's going to happen. There are no magic red shoes whose heels we can click together to take us home. We have to do this, but we can't do it alone. We have to do it together. And what is the first step to being together? Using our voice to talk about why it matters and to talk about what we can do to fix it. So it's over to you now. You get to ask me the questions. And here's the way this goes. You can put in any question you have, as many words as you want, but the fun part is you get to upvote the questions you most want me to answer. We just have nine minutes here. So put in your question if you have a question, but even if you don't have a question, go there, look at the questions that are being put up, and upvote the ones that you like best. That is not a question, nor, it, nor, is it, nor is it a good guess for Wordle. <laughs> oh, that's a, thank you. That's, you know, I've never had that question before, ever. <laughs> thank you so much. That is a great question. Um, oh, excellent questions. Excellent questions. Fantastic questions. Well, thankfully, if you support the Nature Conservancy, now you're supporting me. <laughs> so there is a great answer to that question right there. And at the Nature Conservancy, I just finished doing our first survey of all the scientists we have on staff. We have over 500 scientists, and you know what? 250 of them are doing communication, not even as part of their job, just because they understand how important it is. So part of what I want to do at the Nature Conservancy is I want to build a program where scientists are, are supported as part of their job. They are trained as part of their job, if they're interested, to go out and talk about this, about why it matters and about what we can do to fix it. That's one of my visions for the state of Indiana, for the state of Michigan, for the state of Illinois, and for our programs in Africa, in India, in Southeast Asia to have scientists who represent the people there and go out and talk about why this matters, what we can do to fix it, and who can empower others to use their voice to do the same. How do I maintain hope in action while avoiding traps like greenwashing? I was talking to a woman the other day, and she was telling me that she is so conscious about her carbon footprint and her plastic footprint. She said that she, doesn't, she, will, go, you know, she will walk a mile to avoid a single piece of plastic, and then she had a heart attack, and she ended up in the hospital, and she said, the thing that depressed me the most was that in one day, caring for me with my heart attack, they wasted more plastic than I have used and produced in my entire life. I bundle my trips so carefully, and I do 90% of my events virtually, and then I read a headline that 3,000 empty flights were taken just to save their gate reservations. And I think to myself, what is the point? When we focus on our carbon footprint, and then we see how these big organizations are, are making changes that to completely negate our actions, of course we feel depressed, angry, frustrated, hopeless. But that's why it's so important to focus on our climate shadow. What's our climate shadow? It's the way we engage as a consumer, as a client or a customer, as a student, as an employee as a church member, as a neighbor, as a citizen. When we use our voice, how do you think an airline changes? When somebody there says something, and they say it to somebody else, and they say, that's a great idea, let's talk to somebody else. And then before you know it, you have United Airlines using more low-carbon biofuel than any other airline in the entire world. Now, I'm not saying they don't have a long way to go, but I'm saying that changes are happening, and why did they happen? Because somebody used their voice. Why are farmers in Indiana engaging in regenerative agricultural practices? Typically, it's because someone said something. And th then they might have said something to somebody else, and they said something to somebody else. Why do representatives and senators join the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus? Yeah, there's actually a Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus <laughs> in the Senate and in the House, because somebody asks, asks them to. Why did two-time Republican Congressman Bob Inglis, very conservative politically, why did he do a 180 on climate change? Because his son said to him, Dad, I'm old enough to vote now. 
but I can't vote for you unless you take another look at climate change. Every single one of us is connected to different people. Why is the Anabaptist Seminary, just south of here, the, why do they have a huge solar array? Because somebody there said, hey, this is what we believe as Anabaptists, and isn't it consistent with clean energy? Every single action started with somebody doing something. And so when you see greenwashing, and believe me, there is greenwashing out there. I see it every day. There was a peer-reviewed article last week on the oil and gas companies comparing their ads to what they were actually doing, and the peer-reviewed journal article concluded they were greenwashing. So it's peer-reviewed science. But when we see that, look for people who are really making a difference and share their stories. How do we change our political reality? Begin with something we have in common. Connect the dots to how it's being affected and bring in a positive, constructive solution that they can get on board with that doesn't have to be for the same reasons that you're on board with it. Look for win-win, win-win, win solutions. And they might be there because of win number two. You might be there because of win number three. That is totally fine. Do your research. Figure out what makes them tick and connect those dots. How do we uh, bring this, these conversations into the classrooms? That is a great question. I think we should be talking about climate change in every classroom. Why? Because the only thing you have to be to care about climate change is a human. And as far as I know, that's most, most of your students. I'm going, to go for, I'm going to go with all. <laughs> all on that one. And we need everybody's skills. We need our artists and our writers. We need our economists and our engineers. We need our medical professionals and we need our lawyers. We need our scientists. We need our physical scientists. We need our social scientists. We need our geographers. We need our natural resource experts. We need our ag extension programs. We need everybody. And so at my university, I'm, helping to I'm working with the Honors College to help design short modules that are nice little packages with a PowerPoint, a recorded video if they want it, a reading, a viewing, an exercise, and a class activity. And these are one-class modules that any instructor across the university is free to take and use in their class. We're going to develop a whole bunch of them so they can pick whichever one they want. It would be ideal if we could develop a week-long module as well so people could go a little deeper. Make those resources available to every single college and every single discipline Make them customized and give them examples of how artists are making a difference. Jill Pelto is the daughter of Murray Pelto, who is a glaciologist. He studies uh, glaciers. So she grew up learning and even hiking with her dad to see these glaciers disappearing. But she's, she's an artist. So you know what she did? She started to take her dad's data and turn it into art. She is turning time series of wildfires burning greater area or glaciers shrinking into art. And you know what? She ended up on the cover of Time magazine last year. That is the power of art to touch us. So don't tell me that there is any discipline that does not relate to this issue, because I can tell you that there is a way that it relates, and there is a way that they can contribute. And that's why it's so important to talk about those solutions right here in the university, because this is where change begins. How do we champion and influence systemic solutions over personal solutions? We do it all. How do we do it all? People say, well, do we need individual or systemic? And I say, yes, <laughs> because how does the system change unless individuals within it change? Do I make changes in my personal life? Yes, I absolutely do. Why do I do that? I do it because I know it's the right thing to do. I do it because I know it encourages me to see that I can make a difference in my life. I do it because it gives me something to talk about with other people, too. I once calculated, I went to my last big bundle before the pandemic was to Alaska, where I had 29 events in seven days. It was a marathon. I calculated before I went to Alaska that if eight of, I mean, I talked to hundreds, probably well over a thousand, maybe over 2,000 people I was there. If eight of those people, if eight out of a thousand, 2,000 people decided to cut their personal carbon footprint 10% as a result from hearing from me, that would, buy, that would well cover the carbon of my flight. But if even one of those people decided I'm going to run for city council. Or if one of those people decided, I'm going to change my business. Or if one of those people decided, we're going to implement a, uh, a, a net, net zero plan for our city or our place of work, our university or our church. Think about the impact of that. Think about the climate shadow of that. So to, I'm going to end with the words of Bill McKibben, who you may know, longtime author and thinker on these issues. And Bill says this. He says, 
The most important thing an individual can do right now is not be such an individual. Connect with each other, because when we connect with each other, that is where we find hope. That's where we encouraged and can encourage each other, and that is ultimately how we change the world. Thank you.